ratify teach interview and interrogation here. And uh, I've got a guest speaker today. It is Chief of Investigations for the El Paso County District Attorney's Office, Andy James. Andy and I go back, what, 35 years? Andy was a rookie assigned to my uh, team when he first joined the police department. He was a police officer with the Colorado Springs Police Department for uh, how long? 30. 30 years. 10 of that, he was the sergeant in charge of homicide. Uh, Andy was also on the SWAT team, and uh, he went through my SWAT sniper school. Did Back when I was a lot younger. <laughs> and we were both younger. I can tell you when you're on the SWAT team, you are in good shape. You work out all the time. But anyways, Andy's here to talk to us about uh, criminal interrogations and investigations. We're talking about the legalities of interviewing and interrogations. He's got a video here of a current case that just came back from the uh, Colorado uh, Court of Appeals was a homicide investigation where there was a controversy about the interrogation, which you're going to watch here in just a few minutes. And he has reams of experience in the realm of investigations and interrogations. I don't know how many he's done over the years, but well into the triple digits, I'm sure. Not, not nearly as many as Ken does. Okay. They, some of them don't watch the homicide. <laughs> not, not nearly as many as the homicide. But Andy here is probably the real homicide hunter. I mean, he was 10 years uh, in criminal investigations, and he is a personally good friend of mine. And uh, Ricky's here. That's all right. You're fine. I'll mark you here. You and Rachel. I saw you come in. I saw you come in. So Andy's going to start, and then when he gets done, I'm going to talk a little bit about interviewing interrogations and some of the legal aspects of it. For those in my class, this is going to cover chapter 10 in our book about interrogations. But I'll turn it over to Andy James. He's got over 40 years in law enforcement. I ask you to give him a warm welcome. I truly appreciate that. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, anytime I can help my very good friend, Rich Radaball, out, I owe it. Uh, kind of, he kind of took me under his wing when I first became a cop. Kind of taught me the way of the world how to survive on the streets, which is very, very important. Uh, so I owe a lot to Rich. Um, a little bit ask him about, about giving somebody flying time, <laughs> or flying lessons sometimes. Uh, yeah, we can't do that on tape. <laughs> <laughs> he invented it. But along those lines, a little bit of my background. As Rich said, I was with CSPD for 30 years. I uh, was real fortunate in my career that I was able to do the things I wanted to do, go where I wanted to go, and it was because of the reputation that I started at right out of the rookie school. Uh, so that's so important for you guys that want to become law enforcement officers is to uh, set that uh, tone right at the beginning. Um, I worked in undercover narcotics uh, as a detective. Yes, I had long hair and an earring and you know, bought dope and thought that was the bomb. I, uh, Left there, went to the SWAT team. Was on the SWAT team for about five years. Uh, was involved in a couple officer-involved shootings, uh, unfortunately. Um, went to the training academy. I taught at the CSPD training academy for about five years. Fortunately, uh, I got promoted out of there. Uh, after I was promoted, went back to the street, spent about six months, and then uh, they tapped me on the shoulder and brought me back to the SWAT team as the supervisor and the boss. Uh, from there, I left there, went back to narcotics, became the supervisor in narcotics. So I've had a world of experience, uh, enjoyed every moment of it, uh, no regrets. Retired from PD in, after 30 years. I know all of you are looking at me going, man, he looks pretty young, how could he have been young? I get that a lot, so. But uh, they don't give it to me, I said I retired. <laughs> But um, I was pretty fortunate as I was getting ready to retire. Uh, our district attorney in the 4th Judicial District, Dan May, um, offered me a job as his chief investigator. The guy was leaving there. Um, it was almost a no-brainer. Uh, I still think I have quite a bit to contribute, only in a different capacity now. So, as Rich mentioned, what I want to talk to you guys about today... Before you do that, how many people work for you now? I have a staff of about 30. I have What's 19 investigators. What's the principal job there? Uh, the investigators there, uh, what they pr primarily do is they focus on enhancing the cases for the attorneys, making that the very best case that they can do 
when they bring it forward to the courts. Uh, it might be that uh, out, at, out in the field, maybe the law enforcement officers forgot to uh, interview someone or, or, or something needs to be clarified or something like that. But my investigators do a wide range of things. They write warrants, they make arrests, um, they're law enforcement officers, they're post certified. Um, so they do quite a bit of it. Um, talk about what you're going to talk about today. <laughs> yeah, what I want to talk to you about today is kind of cool. Uh, it was real fortunate when Rich called and asked me if I'd be a guest speaker. I was honored. And I started putting stuff together. And then again on April 6th, just not too long ago, what is that, about two weeks ago, I got a ruling from a court of appeals on a homicide case that I worked back in 2012. My team worked back in 2012 on a murder case. We, we uh, convicted two people for the murder in 2012. And as you can see, it took five years now. Five years for this to come back. So that's how important interviews and interrogations are, and knowing what you're doing, and knowing what the laws are with it, and what to expect. Um, this is a case that involves uh, two defendants and a victim. It occurred on Tuesday, August 24th, 2012, at about 23 hours. It happened at 1624 South Nevada Avenue. Everybody's familiar with South Nevada? We call that a target-rich environment down there. So, um, in, apartment, in a motel room number 30. The suspects is a female by the name of Jeanette Sil Silvia and another male by the name of Santos Joseph Torres. Does anybody in here know those people? <laughs> uh, Jeanette and... Uh, Torres were staying at this hotel room. They were boyfriend and girlfriend. Jeanette on the side was also a prostitute. She would go out and earn money. The victim in this case, they lured back to the motel room. And, uh, Jeanette called him up and said, hey, you want to come over? He says, absolutely. Put me in, coach. He comes over, heads back to the motel room. When he gets in the motel room, He's encountered by Jeanette and the other suspect, uh, Santos Torres. Um, an altercation encountered in the bathroom of the motel room there. The victim was murdered by uh, Sylvia and Torres. He was strangled with a belt and stabbed numerous times with a butcher and art with a butter knife. They wrapped him up in the shower curtain, tied him up, laid him in the bathtub, stole his truck, stole his wallet, stole the keys to the truck, obviously, and left him there for dead. Uh, in about 20, 33 hours, the police department gets a call, says, hey, uh, we've got a dead body in our bathtub. The owner of the motel goes in to, to uh, see what was going on, goes in and finds the body in the bathtub. Patrol goes out there, they go in and look at the guy wrapped up in the shower curtain. Uh, the belt was still around his neck, and he had several uh, puncture wounds. They said, well, time to call out the major crimes. So I get a call, uh, get my team together, we respond down there. Uh, the suspect stole the truck, as I mentioned, and his wallet. The truck was involved shortly after that in three traffic accidents, three different traffic accidents. Uh, they arrested the driver of the truck, who was Jeanette Silva, and Santos bolted and left her there. They arrested her. Um, she was uh, transported to CJC, where she was facing all the charges and stuff. And fortunate for us, um, we get to the motel. She used her real name to rent the room. Had Torres as a person that could stay there with her. So those are the primary people we obviously were looking for. We want to find them. Start looking at uh, um, Jeanette, learn through calls for service and stuff. 
that she had been involved in a traffic accident and involved in a red truck. That's what the victim's truck was, was a red truck. Leads us to CJC. Uh, we go down there. Um, uh, Colorado State Patrol had already impounded the truck. We go pick it up, bring it back to our evidence lot, and we obtain a search warrant for the pickup truck. Located in the pickup truck was a, a butter knife in the bed of the truck with blood on it. It's getting good, isn't it? It's getting good. We're all over this. Well, I'm sorry, I'm probably good solvers. Yeah, we're all over this one. Um, we also go down to CJC, where Jeanette's located. Obviously pull her out on a body receipt, bring her up to the police operations center where we're going to interview her. Then we say, well, you know what? She stabbed this guy. There's probably blood on her clothes. We write a warrant because we have to. She ought to get the stuff out of her personal property. On a pink bra that she would put in her personal property was quite a bit of blood. We interview uh, Jeanette. I have one of my uh, senior detectives, Detective Derek Graham. He's been doing homicides probably for about 25 years. He's one of the best in the state. He's well known. We have people from other states calling asking him for copies of types of search warrants that he's written and all of his knowledge. He was our guest speaker last year. Was he? Yeah, but he's in court this, this time, so he wasn't available. So I was the second choice? <laughs> <laughs> And anyway, Derek interviews her, and she admits that uh, they asked the victim to come over to the hotel. She knows the guy is a dip, her boyfriend. She tries to buffalo us a little bit and says, uh, no, I don't know the name you're asking him about. So Derek pulls up a picture and goes, is this the guy that you know as whoever? She goes, yeah, that's him. That's him. That's my boyfriend. We knew who he was. We pulled up his driver's license and all of that kind of stuff. So she says that uh, the victim shows up, the two of them there, that the uh, her boyfriend, Santos, and the victim get into a fight and an argument, and it goes into the bathroom. She says that... Uh, she goes into the bathroom. She sees her boyfriend standing over the guy in the tub with blood everywhere and uh, holding on to a belt around the guy's neck. She says, all of a sudden, the guy comes out of the bathroom. He's covered in blood. He says, we got to get out of here. we got to get out of here. And she sees that he's holding the victim's keys. She didn't have anything to do with it, so she says. So, we know at that point we've got her, um, and now we start looking for Santos. We have no idea where he is. A day and a half later, I believe it was, we get a call from a priest at St. Mary's Church saying that they have a guy up there that's got blood on him and says he just killed somebody. Or said his, I'm sorry, said his girlfriend killed somebody. So now we got them both pointing the finger at each other, right? Um, Derek does a great job in interviewing Jeanette, getting her to lock in her story, as all good detectives do. She locks in her story, and then he starts pushing her about her more involvement in it. She finally admits that as her boyfriend strangling the guy with the belt, she stabs him with the butter knife. Finally get her to the next lap. And then she lawyers up. That's okay. You're good. So we get Santos. Um, when we first contact him, says he's been involved in a traffic accident, doesn't feel good, uh, all of this stuff. So we, being what's required by law, or not by law, but what's required and what's, what's good practice, Says he's not feeling good, says he might have been injured from the wreck. He admits he was in the truck. We take him uh, to the hospital. Hospital clears him. We bring him back to the police operations center for an interview. 
Throughout the interview, he fesses up. Finally, at the end, he fesses up. Um, goes to court, goes to trial. Both of them convicted of first degree murder. Now they uh, appeal the conviction based upon the uh, uh, interview. What I'm going to show you is a little bit of the interview and whether you guys think we were right in what we did here. Because the Court of Appeals has made a ruling on it on April 6th. The guy requests, or he, he says that he had, you'll see it here. It's, it's good stuff. And what I'd like to do is we'll talk, we'll get it to a point where my detective reads in the rights, you'll hear his response, we'll stop. And I'd like to have some input. Derek, Detective Grant took him down the road, kind of uh, took him the path he wanted him to go. He bit on it, he went all the way down. He finally admits at the very end to him being the one strangling the guy while Jeanette stabbed him. Both of them confess. convicted at trial, they file an appeals with the Colorado uh, Court of Appeals. Let me read you a little bit of the inserts that came back from that, uh, from that case from the Court of Appeals. It's kind of cool. Defendant Santos Joseph Torres appeals an order denying his motion to suppress and the judgment of conviction entered on a jury verdict finding him guilty of multiple offenses. Here's kind of the facts of the case that the Court of Appeals looked at. The defendant and his girlfriend lured the victim to their hotel room where they stabbed and strangled him to death. They then left the victim's truck crashing it three times. Police found the defendant the next day and transported him to the hospital for a medical treatment. Remember I told you that? There he was medically cleared before being transported to the police station where he was interviewed. At the interview, a detective read uh, the defendant his Miranda rights. He then asked the defendant if he wishes to speak to him. The defendant replied, I don't mind. I wish I had a lawyer present. The detective asked the defendant to clarify a statement to which the defendant replied, I want to talk to you. The detective repeated the Miranda advisement and asked the defendant to confirm that he understood the meaning of each right. The defendant confirmed that he understood and further questioning the defendant confessed to killing the victim. At trial, the jury found the defendant guilty of one count of first degree murder, one count of first degree murder felony murder, Two counts of aggravated robbery, two counts of aggravated motor vehicle theft in the first degree, and three counts of an accessory to a crime. Uh, the court also concluded that the defendant's five habitual criminal charges had been established beyond a reasonable doubt. It then merged the defendant's felony murder count into his after deliberation murder count and entered the judgment on all remaining convictions. The motion to suppress. The defendant contends the trial court erred when it denied his motion to suppress his confession because he had, and this is kind of an interesting terminology that they use that Rich is probably familiar with, I hadn't been, but uh, uh, they denied his motion to suppress his confession because he had unambiguously requested an attorney. Meaning he didn't say, I want an attorney. He said, I wish I had an attorney present. That's by the trial court. Okay? Let's hear what the, let's hear what the Court of Appeals has to say about that. Uh, they go on to state that uh, re when reviewing the a district court's decision to suppress statements made by a defendant, the question before the court is a mixed issue of law and fact. 
where sufficient evidence exists in the record to support the trial court's factual fin findings, we defer to those findings, but the legal effect of those facts constitutes a question of law subject to de novo review. I don't know what that means, but... De novo means that they're going to look at every fact in the case. And that's exactly what they say in common English. <laughs> I don't know what that means. <laughs> de novo review means they're going to look at all the facts, not just the ones that are being examined. Exactly. Where the statement sought to be suppressed, and this is kind of interesting, they found this. Uh, where the statements sought to be suppressed are audio and video recorded, and there are no disputed uh, of the facts outside the recording controlling the suppression issue. Meaning that because it was audio and video recorded, that's exactly what was said. The defendant can't say, I said this. And Detective Graham can't say, I said this. It's right there. That's why we do that. Uh, if a suspect makes a, uh, and, and it just basically goes on to say that they, they take an under, uh, independent review of the audio and video recording to determine whether the statements were properly suppressed in light of the controlling law. If a suspect makes a reference to an attorney that is ambiguous or uh, that a reasonable officer in light of the circumstances would have understood only that the suspect might be invoking his right to counsel, uh, it's not required. In determining whether an accused has invoked his right to counsel, the proper inquirer under Davis is whether a reasonable police officer in the circumstances would understand the statement to be a request for an attorney. He goes on to say that we assess whether a request for counsel is ambiguous by considering what Rich said, the totality of the circumstances, including such factors as the interrogating officer's words, accused words referring to counsel, Officer's response to the accused reference to counsel, accused speech patterns, interrogating officer's demeanor and tone, accused behavior, or uh, I'm sorry, accused youth, criminal history, background, nervousness, or distress, and feeling of intimidation or powerless. Uh, the defendant argues that the trial court should have suppressed his statements to the detective because the detective failed to stop the questioning after he unambig unambiguously requested an attorney. Based on our review of the court's factual findings and our independent review of the video recordings, and under the totality of the circumstances, we find that after the detective read the defendant his Miranda rights, the detective had the following exchange. Detective, having these rights in mind, do you wish to talk to me now? Defendant, I don't mind. I wish I had a lawyer present. Detective, you say you don't mind, and you also say you wish you had a lawyer present. Sort of telling me a little bit, you might want to talk to me, but you might want to have a lawyer. And then it goes on to a couple other things. Uh, defendant was then given a Miranda rights form to sign. He signed the form, but wrote that he was under duress. The detective, the detective asked the defendant why he felt he was under duress. The defendant stated it was because he had not done anything wrong, but he did not mind talking to the detective. Uh, the following facts found by the trial court and based on our independent review of the video show the defendant's request for counsel was ambiguous for the following reasons. The detective def testified that his use of language was intended to clarify his confusion regarding the defendant's ambiguous request for counsel. He also repeated the defendant multiple times that he had the right to an attorney. We heard that a lot of times, didn't we? After being read his Miranda rights, the defendant was asked if he would like to speak with the officer. In response, the defendant stated, I don't mind, I wish I had a uh, lawyer present. The de de detective asked the defendant to clarify his request for counsel. You say you don't mind, and you also say you wish you had a lawyer present, sort of telling me a little bit of both. 
the uh, interview video shows that the defendant's tone of voice in the video was not assertive. The defendant's tone and demeanor, or I'm sorry, the detective's tone and demeanor was uh, conversational and unintimidating. And the defendant did not appear under the influence of any duress related to the detective's conduct, despite writing he was under duress on the Miranda warning. The detective testified that the defendant was able to walk into the room under his own powers. He was able to walk to the restroom under his own powers. He wasn't falling against the walls or anything. The defendant was 49 years old and had been previously convicted of five felonies. The defendant was medically cleared before transported to the hospital, to the police, or from the hospital to the police station. He was also given a restroom break and a cigarette break during that interview. The detective collected his basic information from the defendant, including his name, birth date, and age. The defendant recalled his mother and sister's full name, addresses, and telephone numbers. The defendant wrote that he was under duress on the Miranda waiver. The detective stopped the questioning at that time and asked why the defendant felt that way. After explaining he felt he had done nothing wrong, the defendant then said he didn't mind talking to the detective. The detective testified that near the conclusion of the interview, the and this was kind of interesting, the defendant fell out of his chair but was later medically cleared. Towards the end of the interview, um, he started going, uh oh. I think I did something wrong here. And he started rolling on the ground having convulsions. It was obvious he was faking them. Uh, there was nothing there. He brought medical in. Medical's telling him, get up. You know, so. Can you show that? Here we <laughs> it's not on there. <laughs> um, at the conclusion, Court of Appeals says that we affirm the court's judgment on all convictions. So, that was an interesting one, wasn't it? You guys are going to be out there if you're going into law enforcement, uh, become a lawyer, or just want to know more about law cases or stuff like that. You guys are going to be out there for two or three days solving serious crimes. The court's going to take five years to come back say that you did it right. So, or what? Or what? <laughs> Any questions? Comments? Concerns? Those of you that raised your hands, give me some feedback. I saw you, man. I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> um, I'm just a little bit confused about why, even though he did say that he would like a lawyer there, why did the court not take that into account when they were doing the very active court cases instead of having the early appeals for the statute? They did take it into account. It was brought up during trial. But I can tell you why they could substitute it. What I talk <coughs> after uh, Andy's done, and I'll explain to you why they can modify this on the run, how they can change their minds about certain things. There's nothing set in stone when it comes to Miranda interrogations. I'm going to talk about that just for a few minutes. But it was brought up at trial. The trial court said, no, man. He didn't invoke his right by saying, I want an attorney. He said, I wish I had one. Ambiguous. Any other input? Yes, sir. I'm curious. Uh, instead of signing the Miranda warning, he wrote, I'm under duress twice. Mm -hmm. um, so he didn't have to sign that at all? The verbal confirmation was enough? He did sign it. He signed okay. it, initialed it, and right next to it he put, I'm under duress, I'm oh. under duress. So, keep in mind, five-time convicted felon. He's been there. He knows the game. Chris, you got a question? So, uh, Detective Grant, he never actually said, just to clarify, you do not want an attorney. Does that help, or does that cross the line into saying he's persuading him he doesn't want? I think you would have been fine saying that, so you mean you don't want it? He actually asked him several times, do you want an attorney? When he read his rights again, he went through it line by line. Remember how he cleared it up? What does that mean to you? You have the right to remain silent. What does that mean to you? 
That's the beauty. And when we roll out on homicide cases at CSPD, I don't say we anymore. I'm at the DA's office now, but I go out on them if I want to. That was, uh, actually, I talked to Derek Graham on that, and uh, we both were out there, and he said that was the longest cases, our case that he had been without sleep. I remember just going into my office, laying on the floor, and get two hours before we had to go back at him. It, it was just crazy. We went for three days straight. Well, I didn't go home for three days, so. But, uh, that's how dedicated and important these cases are. But um, it's kind of interesting. I was, I was so happy this came back like that. Uh, the beauty of what I was going to say is when CSPD rolls out on a homicide case, they roll out, of course, with the team, the homicide detectives, crime scene investigators, um, and we always, always roll out with a member of the district attorney's office, a senior attorney. I had them in my hip pocket during all of that. When we got to that point, we were going, oh, man. They're down the hallway in the little room watching this on TV. We're watching it on TV. Derek comes out and goes, wow, he goes, I can clean that up. I can clean that up, man. We can, we can move forward on this. The attorney's pulling out legal books and you know, all kinds of stuff. And I'm sitting there drinking my coffee going, dang, this isn't as easy as I thought it was. But um, we worked through it. It was a long trial. Uh, lasted quite a while. As you see, that interview, I think it lasted a couple hours maybe, I can't remember, but um, a couple hours on an interview, and they had five years to go back and criticize that and take a look at it. So it is very, very important uh, interview and intervention. Thank you. I have a PowerPoint presentation, but I'm going to spare you that. And we're just going to roll through this really quick. First of all, there's nothing in the Constitution that says that the police have to advise you of your rights. Okay, so you need to remember that right away. When the police arrest somebody or bring them in and they're in custody, they are obligated to give them a random warning because of a court case. So it is completely a judge-made rule. It is not in the Constitution. If judges make it, judges can modify it. Remember that. So that's why they can sit there and look at this stuff and say, well, he kind of asked for an attorney, but he didn't because it's a judge-made rule. In the case of Ernesto Miranda versus Arizona, he was accused of rape, or Ernesto was, and he was a migrant worker. He lived in Mexico. English was his second language. He only had a sixth grade education from Mexico. He would come to the United States six months out of the year to pick fruit. He comes here. He sees a girl he likes. He asks her out. She tells him to drop dead. So he breaks into her apartment and rapes her. So he decided he would take a shortcut and not have to spend money on a dinner and flowers and so forth. So the funny thing is she knew who he was. So she goes to the police and says, Ernesto Miranda broke into my bedroom window and raped so they pick him up, they bring him down. The interrogation only lasted two hours. No one coerced him, no one forced him, no one threatened him. They talked to him, they asked him what happened, he admitted to it. Later, his convict he was convicted at trial, got eight years for rape, for burglary and rape. His lawyers at the time filed an appeal to the US Supreme Court saying that he did not know he didn't have to speak to the police. That is under the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. You have the right not to incriminate yourself. Under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution, you have a right to have an attorney. So those are two amendments in the Constitution that says that you have the right not to speak to the police, and you also have the right to have an attorney. 
So the Supreme Court said, obviously he would not know this because he was not a citizen of the United States, did not grow up in the United States, did not have any type of education to speak of, and therefore it now falls on the police to tell you your rights. There's a whole litany of rights listed in the Constitution, but those are the only two that the police have to tell you. But the court's the one that came up with that rule. So now we have a lot of reasons that we can modify that. There are dozens and dozens of exceptions to the Miranda Rule. If I'm chasing somebody, like, Wet, like Chandler here, and he's running, and he throws a gun underneath a merry-go-round while I'm chasing him through a park, and I tackle him, and I say, is he in custody if I tackle him? The police grab you by the ankles and throw you to the ground. Are you in custody? Uh, no, you have to put the cuffs on. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell said that? <laughs> so if someone grabs you by the neck and throws you on the ground and is sitting on top of you, you're not in custody? I'm just playing. Are you just playing? No, you're in custody. And if I say, where's the gun? Is that a question? Is that an interrogation? It's a question. Is it an interrogation? Maybe. Especially if I'm standing on you? And you go, I threw it under the merry-go-round when we ran through the park. That's what they call it. That's the case I'm talking is New York Reed Quartz. That's what they call an exigent circumstances. Now an emergency, some little kid can find that gun and shoot somebody, right? Think it's a toy. Pick it up, point it at their friend. That's exactly what happened in New York v. Quarles. Quarles was coming out of a little family mom and pop grocery store. He had just robbed it. Two cops just happened to be, you know, your cops are never there when you need them. Well, they happen to be there. I don't know if they needed them or not. They go, oh, look, that guy's a robber. And so they start chasing him. And he runs through a park, throws a gun underneath the merry-go-round. They don't see that happening. Few, when they exit the park, the cops gang tackling. And they saw the gun in his hand when he came out. That's how they knew it was a robbery. These were really sharp cops. <laughs> Money in one hand, gun in the other. Picked that up immediately. Definitely detected material. And so, as soon as they tackle him, they said, where's the gun? And he tells them. So his attorney says that he was in custody, and it was an interrogation. It was something to elicit some type of confession or admission. He didn't ask him what his name was or where he lived. That's not an interrogation, but where the gun was. And he told him it was underneath the merry go And the courts gave it an exception. If the cops don't think you're in custody, but you are in custody, they can also claim that they did it under the fair rule, that they thought they were being fair. For an example, I get sent to a, a bar fight, and the 30 or 40 people are fighting. I grab four or five of them, I handcuff them, I put them on the curb. I say, you sit here until I get back. And I'm trying to figure out who's involved and what happened. And I come over and say, what's your side of the story? Is that an interrogation? No. Yes, but is he in custody? He's handcuffed sitting on the curb. I told him not to leave. Courts have said no, no, because of the duration, it's so short. If you get pulled over by the police and they think you've been drinking, so I come up to you, I pull you over, you're weaving, it's 11 o'clock at night, I as a cop know that one out of seven drivers are now intoxicated, so I've got you pulled over and I look at you and I said, how many beers have you had tonight? And you give me the standard two. I don't care if you've had 20, it's always two, or four, six, it's always two. <laughs> And so you've made an admission that you've started drinking already. Are you in custody? No. Have you ever tried to leave after the police tried to pull you over? A lot of things happen, all of them bad to the driver if they leave. So are you in custody? Are you free to leave? Okay. Was that an interrogation? How much have you had to drink tonight? Is that an interrogation? I'm asking you to admit to something, right? That can incriminate you, correct? Mm -hmm. How many people think that's an interrogation? How many think people think you're in custody when the police pull you over for a traffic stop? Okay? Common sense says that's correct. The courts say no. The courts say no. No reason other than, you know, they do a lot of traffic stops, so we're not going to count that under Miranda. That's the beauty of a judge-made rule. They can make all these exceptions. Traffic stops are not in custody. They just wave their little magic wand and say, not in custody. That's all. That's not, but trust me, I was a cop for 30 years. Andy was a cop for 30 years. What happens when you pull somebody over and they go, 
I'm not in custody, I'm driving away, Officer Radaball. And they pull away. <laughs> what happens is all bad for them. Everything is bad, bad. Right? I mean, it involves high speed, some ramming goes on, somebody gets pulled out the driver window, they don't bother to roll it down first. All of it's bad. So you say, well, gosh, I'm trying to think of this logically. That's the beauty of the law. There is no logic. <laughs> no logic at all. You cannot know this intuitively. You have to know the law case by case. You cannot sit there and go, gee, you can't, you're not free to leave. Oh, I'm, you know, let me digress a little bit. In order for you to be forced to give the Miranda warning, two things have to occur. The suspect has to be in custody and it has to be an interrogation. Okay? So those two things have to be present. With those two things, then you have to give a Miranda. So going back to this individual here, Mr. Torres, was he in custody? Yes. Yeah. Obviously, he even had jail clothes on, I noticed that. So he had his jail clothes on, so obviously he's That's right, he took his clothes. <laughs> but he's wearing his jail clothes, and now is he being interrogated? Yeah. What's the purpose of the interview? So to find out his opinion on the Broncos that year? Are they going to win? No. They want to find out information about the, the murder. So he was being interrogated, he was in custody, so they have to give him Miranda. But it all boils down to what's in custody. So being handcuffed, sitting on the curb, is not in custody. Being stopped by the police and not being free to leave for 30 or 40 minutes till I write a ticket or arrest you is not in custody. The average person would go, geez, that looks like custody to me. But that's the beauty of this case. Because it is a judge-made rule, they modify it at will. And there's all these different exceptions. There's the emergency exception. In fact, if you ever get in law school, you'll read one called Pig versus Colorado. If my last name was Pig, P-I-G-G, -G, I would definitely change it. <laughs> but he didn't. They get a domestic. The cops show up. They walk in. Immediately they go, what's that smell? And Pig go, or Pig's wife goes, why, that's his meth lab in the basement that you're smoking. <laughs> Was he in custody? They were already arresting for domestic violence. Yes? They were arresting her too. Is that an interrogation? What's that smell? Well, the court said it was. Because they, they were asking because it smelled like a meth lab to them. They weren't asking because it was just an odd odor. You know, like maybe roses and, you know, petunias or something. But the court then ruled that even though it was an interrogation, even though everybody was in custody, that there was an emergency. What happens to meth labs when you arrest the people that are taking care of the meth lab and no one's there to watch the meth labs? Boom. Yes. Boom, boom, boom. And so, an exigent circumstance. Ray Jesti statements, statements that are made in the heat of the emotion. I come in, Rory has killed Ashley. Ashley's laying on the floor. This room is filled with people. I walk up to Rory, I go, what happened? I just killed Ashley. He just blurted that out. That's an exception. I didn't have to give him Miranda because he just, it's a Ray Jesti statement. So what I'm just pointing this out to you is that we have rules that we are all grown up with believing and understanding that you have to have Miranda. You can't search a house without a warrant. But because these rules are made by the courts, not by the Constitution, they modify them at will. There are so many exceptions to the warrant exception where you don't need a warrant to search. There are so many exceptions to the Miranda rule where you don't have to advise people of that. And just be aware of that, but do not ever rely on your intuition. Don't sit there and think that this, logically this makes sense. He's in custody and he made a statement. That statement doesn't come in. Did I tell you, I told my class about it, but I'm gonna tell you guys. There was a case, uh, it was in Iowa. This little girl disappears from the school. The janitor disappears the next day as well. The police are suspicious. They put out an ATV and all points bulletin. They're looking for this individual. The public defender shows up to the uh, police station and says, I'm representing this guy. Do not interrogate him. They go, okay. He gets arrested in another jurisdiction, but still in the same state, so they don't need to extradite him. So these two detectives go pick him up. It's in the wintertime. It's just a few days before Christmas. And they're driving this janitor back to uh, their city. 
and they start talking among themselves, the two detectives. And they're going, oh, that poor little girl. She's laying in the snow someplace. If we don't find her body soon, she'll be covered by snow, and the coyotes will get her. And her parents, <laughs> her parents won't be able to find her body. It'll be horrible. We just want to find the body so they'll have closure. I hate that word, closure. But we're going to use it today. So this goes on for two hours. Dolly, what's the purpose of that conversation? To get him to confess. They're not talking to him, right? They're talking, but they can hear it. And they ask you, they're just as close as. So, what does he do? He goes, all right, let me show you where the body is. They go to this cornfield, and there's a little girl. She's been raped and murdered. She's about 11 years old. Goes to court. What was the purpose of the conversation? What was the purpose of the conversation between the two detectives? Were they really concerned about this little girl being eaten by coyotes? So what was the purpose? What did his lawyer tell the detectives? So was that an inter form of interrogation? To them, they were playing loose and fast with the rules. They thought since they didn't ask him specifically, it was an interrogation. But the judge was able to insert his own common sense and says, yes, it was an interrogation. So how do we get by that? He was interrogated. His lawyer, he lawyered up. His lawyer said not to talk to him. Well, the judge has little children. He lives in that community. He's not going to let a murderer go on a technicality. So he just goes, a new rule. They would have found the body eventually. It might have been spring. Maybe it had been a couple of months. But the farmer would have walked out to his cornfield and gone, oh my god, there's a skeleton here. So we're going to keep it in under the inevitable discovery rule. See how easy that was? Obviously a violation of Miranda. Obviously a violation of the rule. But the judge just couldn't bring himself to release a child murderer back into the public. And so what he does is he creates his own exception. It goes up to the US Supreme Court. They go, we like that. We like that exception. And for those of you in my class, what if that had been a bale of marijuana? And they were going, that poor bale of marijuana. <laughs> Sitting out in a field someplace. Some cow or horse could nibble on it. And God knows what would happen. Just go and mock and trample a dozen people. Do you think they would have found the inevitable discovery rule? Or they would have just tossed out the... Because when they, the petition was not only to suppress the statements, but under the poisonous fruit of the poisonous tree, anything that's found based on those statements would have gone out so her little body would not have been evidence. And how do you prove a murder if you don't have a body? So they would have had to toss out the body and his statements. So if that had been a bale of marijuana, do you think they would have... The judge would have come up with the inevitable discovery rule? That's another thing to look at is the seriousness of the offense. And these exceptions almost always occur when somebody has been killed in the cases of murder. So just something to remember. That's how it fluid it flows. It goes and ebbs and flows because judges in the court system are made of human beings. They understand the, the technicalities and the legalities and the realities of prosecuting cases. So in the future when you do this, you have to know these cases. You cannot just do it intuitively. Because you can look at that and go, yeah, he was in custody. They told him he was under arrest. This was an interrogation. They were looking to him to make an admission that they could use against him in a court of law. And yet they're, they're going to find an exception, like in quarrels. Okay, that's it. You guys are great.